Our assumption to Judaism time relates to creation, redemption, messianism, and commandment. In this sense, the notion itself implies and encompasses two truly different categories, the eschatological and the human times, which in turn are leading to another conceptualization summarized by the famous expression God's time versus humanity times. This having been said, let's try to get at it. Following the outline that has been set, I start with the origin of the concept of time, which can be traced, as we know, to the first chapter of Genesis with the word Yom. And there was evening and there was morning, the day one, Yom Echad, trailing which one of the act of God's creation until the sixth day. And for even if there were already evenings and mornings at the beginnings, time itself was created on the fourth day only with the light in the dome of the sky to separate the days from the night, which are to become, I think again, sign for seasons and for days and years. Genesis. Yom here doesn't mean time yet. It means the second child interlude between the states of darkness and luminosity. The Jewish tradition takes this verse as a dynamic process, ordaining Jewish temporality into universal time. The stars have given the light of creation to a first day. They allow the human spaces to distinguish the nighttime darkness from daylight and are thus adding each new day to a preceding one, fixing up a temporal succession. Then, the luminaries the sun and the moon would serve in the future to indicate to the Jews the moments of celebration they have to strictly keep. To. The narrative of the creation tells us that on the fifth day, first day, as today, all the living creatures in the air, in the sea, and on the earth were created. Hence, we are today in the day of the wildlife. Jewish temporality is organized around the rhythm of the creation of the world realized in seven days, the last of which is particular because, quoting, on the seventh day he rested. This rhythm, symbolized by the number seven, governs both the week-long revolution around the Shabbat and the cycles of the weeks of years that punctuate follows and jubilees. This arrangement, which consecrates one day a week to a time that is escaping time, is understood as a remembrance of creation. Since it is entirely devoted to the divine, it thus governs a specific distribution of temporality between the profane and the sacred space times, or, let's say, between the here and now, present time, and the over life time to come. If a Shabbat is observed in all places, the weeks of years which govern the social and agricultural laws related to fallow land make sense only in the land of Israel. The complete original sequence is therefore the weekly rhythm punctuated by the suspension of a seventh day, the Shabbat. This sequence has brought out a unique paradigm associating the seventh day with a notion of freedom, which extends to then to a sabbatical year and the cycle of jubilees. This is the entry to Jerusalem. And you can see a clock giving the time entry of a Sabbath on the day the picture was taken, of course. In order to refer to time, the biblical corpus offers many and distinct definitions. Olam is the most frequently used word. It implies every facet of a notion of time, though it indicates in today's language the universe as well as eternity. In the Bible, it refers to a time that is hidden, 
and unknown and also connotes four overall notions. One, eternity. Two, the past centuries, the remote, the ancient time. Three, the time to come. Or even fourth, the whole span of human life. Ultimately, it denotes the totality of the universe in the harmonic corpus, Olam evokes the categories of nature, existence, universe, lifespan, and eternity. The same, the same term thus covers all the aspects of time, eternity as well as the limited duration of human life, the terrestrial world as well as the world to come, limited time, as well as the infinite, the measurable, as well as the immeasurable, the hidden or the unknown. When it comes to human time, the first definition is historical. The Bible refers to the days, yamim, the times, as in divrei yamim, which signal history in the sense of a narration of yemot olam, the days of the world which define history in a broad sense. Quoting, remember the days of old, consider the years long past, from Deuteronomy. In this sense, Olam refers to the man, as used in contemporary language to mean time. Zman illustrates the image of time that passes when measured or counted by marking an indefinite time, like that perpetuated by ecclesiastic. It is available in the form of zamin, temporary, or ephemeral with zmani. It is a time that escapes the notion of eternity and indicates the passage and the movement. However, its rare biblical occurrences show that it also involves the thought we choose. It thus appears in Esther, in the books of Nehemiah, and in Daniel, when the history of Israel crosses the history of a nation. <coughs> Moed, derives from testimony. The world connotes a moment, an encounter, and an appointment between the divine and the human. Quoting, the Lord set a time, saying, tomorrow, from Exodus. The time of meeting, the rendezvous with the divine, or El Moed, indicates the place, the tent of meeting and witness. Thus, Moed indicates duration, permanence. It refers to an era, to a structuring and signifying time, and defines the liturgical times. It is a fixed temporality. In its plural form, Moadim, <coughs> means the festivals which extend the cosmic time as in, quoting, let them be for signs and for days and years from Genesis. They are torn away from memory or experience attached to a later and settle in a future that opens and extends beyond. However, Moed also refers to a passing time, a moment of change, or even of reversal. It is the time of an epoch which is no longer an era still present which is passing while it remains the incessant time of the inner charm, a moment of irreversible duration. The surplus of this denomination for time is the one wondered by the word et. The Bible says be et ahi at that time in illo tempore as translated by the Vulgate, which is found in la colsman ve et, et la ledet ve et la mut, none in the form that has become proverbial, quoting, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose, a time to be born and a time to die, on Kohelet. This fleeting time reflects the urgency of the now, epitomized by its lack. The time is not come the time that the Lord's house should be built, end of quote. It also points out the time that eludes the decision of the will of man because it corresponds to the hour chosen by God, the et ratzon. As such, it ensures that this time is out of chronology and makes sense only in a prophetic reading of time, 
biblical interpretation based on sources and leading to an end which remains sealed but which will come in its time. Next point. Theological and philosophical principle. The Torah might be understood as a figure of a flow of a time in itself. On the one hand, it is a reckoning of religious duties arranged for their collective reading in cyclical order which determines the year. On the other hand, starting with the creation of time and the universe, the Torah provides the national historical chronology. Moreover, since the entire Bible itself is ordered into weekly portion read at the synagogue, giving a date by one of its names is a way to locate something into time. Today, we are in the week of Miketz, which is itself a time world to demarcate time, like in Miketz Natayim Yamim, Miketz Yamim, the end of the days. As such, the Torah shapes also the very foundation that enables the reckoning of the past and makes it permeate the present. Expanding this idea, the Torah personifies the primary structure of time. In the famous words of Abraham Yeshua Eschel, Judaism is a sheer architecture of time. Metaphysical question which are not found in the legal corpus of the Talmud were, however, by no means foreign to the rabbis. This is attested by the corpora of the Agadah and the Midrash. Thus, the question of a philosopher of antiquity, such as the emergence of the universe from a creation ex nihilo, or from a pre-existing eternal matter, as discussed in Plato's Timus, and will occupy a considerable place in the thought of medieval scholars, are found among the rabbis in an allegorical form. Has the universe been created within a continuum of time, or, conversely, is time a product of creation? This kind of interrogation aims to solve a fundamental questioning about the origin of the universe and the divine itself. The Midrash Genesis Rabba says, quoting, six things preceded the creation of the world, some as creations, others as project. The Torah and the throne of glory were effective creation. The patriarch, Israel, the temple, and the name of the Messiah were conceived as project. End of quote. According to Alexander Altman, the rabbinic corpus transposes three great cosmological traditions rooted in the Hellenistic period. All of the three are related to the various interpretations of a Genesis account of creation. However, they expose different approaches to the conceptualization of time. The first defends the idea of a creation from pre-existent and eternal matter. It is found in the wisdom of Solomon. The second leans toward creation ex nihilo. It appears in the second book of the Maccabees and in some epigraphic texts, like the Slavonic Enoch or Esdras IV. The third tradition is a theory of emanation taken from the mantle of light mentioned in Psalm 10. More speculative, it draws from the notion of a logos developed by Philo. It first arises in the Book of Jubilees and even in the Midrashic literature before being widely displayed in mystical texts such as the Sefer Yetzirah, uh, the Book of Creation, the Sefer Abair, Book of Clarity, and in the Corpus of Zohar. From a conceptual perspective, the idea of time closely related to theology has a special status since the blossoming of philosophy among Jews in the ninth century. The everyday contact established between Jews and Muslim culture and civilization, notably with the Kalam, inspired Jewish thinkers to elaborate more speculative and theological theories. For Jewish philosophers, 
or speculation are rooted in the death of Greek sources were visited by Muslim thinkers, time remains a divine attribute in which human beings are moving. Apprehending time this way amounts to approaching the notion of the divine by navigating between the statement of Plato, Aristotle, and Plotinus. From medieval to contemporary Jewish thinkers, this tension between the relation to temporality and the idea of time seems never to have diminished as if the relation to science or historicity could not fill the open fold between time lived and time fold. While excelling the allegorical treatment revealed by the formulation of ancient texts, their formulation illustrates how medieval Jewish thinkers fit into the theological and philosophical debates of their contemporaries. They now contemplate the time according to the terms of the Neoplatonic, Aristotelian, and Neo-Aristotelian currents of thought, which postulated that time is a movement. Far away from the human time, God is also outside the process of creation. He generates, but is not generated. Counts, but cannot be counted. He is located in an immutable time, and thus incarnates eternity. Seeking to harmonize the Jewish doctrines of the creation and finiteness of time with these philosophical currents of medieval philosophers will prompt the elaboration of different visions regarding creation ex nihilo, yesh me'ain in Hebrew, the causality of the universe, miracles, and revelation. Others, without restricting their approaches to the notion pertaining specifically to the cosmic situation of the Jews, will envision time in cycle of thousands of years unfolding in a universal space. However, despite the philosopher's desire for imitatio dei, an abyss divides the universe of man from that of the divine, which the human understanding does not allow to grasp. If God is the unknowable, the unpronounceable, as Maimonides understood it, how nevertheless is it possible to apprehend him? By blurring the boundaries between the world of the here and the world of the above, advocating the surpassing of these limits, the mystical approach would shift this relation to time that had installed God in a kind of extraterritorial special temporal place which he transcends in order to better penetrate the ultimate meaning of existence and the universe. A constellation of conception and representation of God, of history and of time, sometimes going so far as to make time one of his attributes, will then emerge. From the literature of the Echalot, Palaces, to the Polish Hasidism, we can see the development of a vast messianic endeavor to reinterpret the commandment by the yardstick of a vision that places the experience of time in the field of action. The idea that it is possible to act on the source of time and history by means of a theologic act on the spherot, the divine hypostasis, is stated, for example, by the Lurianic Kabbalah, especially by Moshe Cordovero, quoting, we are the people of God, Therefore, all our behavior and the revolution of our time are counted by us exactly in accordance to the sphere of a sphere. And here runs the period, he, God, arrange the period of a year and the motion of the stars in such a way as to enable us to know out of our sounds. End of in the mystical vision, as presented by Moshe Idel, the practice of the commandment is a dynamic contribution to the divine action. The Kabbalist may thus shift each moment into sanctified time by performing appropriate rituals, 
the most ordinary activities, as will be the case in the conception developed within the Polish Hasidism, would thus come to transcend history and reinterpret the conception of time. Next point, the historical development of a concept. The rhythm of a calendar organizes the daily life of the Jews and strengthens their collective identity. This is uh, the clock of a Jewish town hall from Prague, 16th century. Mm. It is also one of the indicators of the multiplicity of temporal register they are juggling with. Since antiquity, the calendar had been the subject of bitter fighting. During the Middle Ages, following the development of Kari descent, we we'll revive the debate. To defend the validity of this calendar placed at the forefront of Kari attacks, will emerge a new kind of religious literature combining the scientific argument with theology. The greatest Jewish figures of the medieval period will devote themselves to it. And for the worlds of calendar computation were already fully fixed in the Jewish world, these scholars introduced new tools, creating a scientific vocabulary in Hebrew and adapting the mathematical language to the Jewish calendar. They succeeded using the laws of the Greek the Greco-Arab astronomy to explain the foundation of its regulation. Thus, passing the calendar from the divine secret, the Sod, to its rational foundation, the Yesod. Insisting that the calculation in force were the work of the rabbis, they brought the non-Jewish science into the tradition, combining exegetical interpretation with scientific explanation. The pedagogical importance attached to this type of work is clear from Maimonides' letter on the Hebrew calendar. As a matter of fact, in the Middle Ages, the science of a star did not distinguish between astronomy and astrology, or works on the Jewish calendar. They were all an important part of the arithmetic calculation of lunation and equinoxes, and the movement of planets and houses in the zodiac. This combination, whose equilibrium varies according to the authors, is apparent in all the medieval calendar treatises. Patent in the 12th century, both at Abraham Bachias and at Abraham Ibn Ezra works, the science of the stars, Chochmat Amazalot, is that of the astrological science. It covers, especially in Ibn Ezra, the four branches of knowledge, astrology, mathematics, astronomy, and calendar regulation. However, it also allows, as Megillat Megale, the role of the revealer composed by, by Bachia shows, to calculate the date of the coming of the Messiah. This importance given to the pragmatic uses of the rhythm of time accorded to that of the planets resounds in some mystical approaches. By contrast, the Ashkenazi literature dealing with calendar is neither speculative nor theological. Enclosed in Bible and in Marzorim and Sidurim, festival and daily ritual of prayer, it is efficient and practical. The Sifre Aivronot, the books of intercalation, spread from the 15th century with the rise of printing. Intended to present a kind of time manual, these works are following the model of their contemporary Christian almanacs. Yet, gradually, the Jewish calendar circulating during the early modern period would become small illustrated handbooks for a Jewish way of life. Speaking to Jewish users living in a Christian environment, calendars offer connection between Jewish and Christian holiday dates. They then include the entire Christian calendar, the names of the month and saints, and according to the region of their production, the dates of the great fairs. 
Scientific advances in the modern age paradoxically make it possible to measure the importance of a symbolic value attached to the maintenance of a tradition in the computation of a Jewish calendar. The mathematical and astronomical work carried out during the medieval period by Abraham Bachia, Abraham Ibn Ezra, Isaac Israeli, and even by the great mathematician Levi Ben Gershom, Gershom he said, had in no way affected the perception of the computation of a calendar. On the contrary, they had rather used their knowledge to ensure its scientific validity and to justify it. On the other hand, the emergence in the 16th century of a critical historical method will provoke the opening of a debate which will show that the function of a calendar no longer arises in terms of scientific accuracy, I rest but rest on the authority of tradition. It raises the important question of scientific criticism versus historical criticism. Scientism versus historicism. Azaria de Rossi published his Meilleur et Naim, The Light of the Ace, in uh, 1573 Mantua. Drawing on the immense literature produced since antiquity, using both Jewish and Christian texts, it questioned both the chronology of origin and the calendar foundation on which the Jewish tradition is grounded. Establishing firmly that the era of creation did not penetrate the Jewish customs until the 10th century, he takes again the account established by the extra Talmudic treatise in the 3rd century, Seder Olam, in order to show the inconsistencies and the gaps to the help from outside historical sources. Moreover, he asserted that despite the information provided by Maimonides, not only is there no precise information about the process that have introduced mathematical computation of a calendar, but that his attribution to a patriarch Hillel Bar Yuda would be upheld exclusively by a late response written in the 10th century. Vehemently criticized by the Maharal of Prague, threatened by with Hanatema by Yosef Caro, De Rossi added to his essay his addendum, quoting, in any event, regardless of whatever increases or subtraction that will be made to the era mundi computation, we shall always retain it. The custom of the ancestor of Israel has the status of Torah as in bygone days. Not only was his criticism historical, but his defense was also historical. He did not say that the date is true or based on strong argument. He said it is a tradition. In response, the learned mathematician and astronomer David Gans disciple and assistant to Tycho Brahe and Kepler, publishes his Zimmer David in Prague in 1592. Written as a historical chronicle in two parallel parts to distinguish the Jewish history from universal history, the book went back to the Jewish chronology taken from its origin. Constantly debating with the Rossi, he stated in turn, quoting, there is no error in our use of a calculation of the years of creation which can make a law or a command to be rejected. No solemnity of its fixed date shall be added or subtracted and nothing shall be moved as long as we last the universe." End of quote. Then, the question of a renewal of a Jewish tradition has arisen anew in the 19th century only. The introduction of historical approaches and critical methods was revolutionizing the approaches of religion and philosophy. Nachman Kroschmal then inaugurated a reflection on the historicity of Judaism. By placing his title under the auspices of the famous opus of Maimonides, 
Koshmal intended to mean that, uh, that Aristotelism was exceeded and that it was now necessary to forge modern orientation to ensure permanence to the Jewish tradition. More ne vouchez as mal, compared to More ne vouchez from Maimonides. Each time has its own perplexities and needs its own guide. Kochmal guides intends to answer to the challenges made to Judaism through atheism, deism, Protestant theology, and was recent approach to biblical criticism and philosophy of religion. Krochmal was a Hegelian philosopher and believed that Geist has revealed itself most fully in his day. The Geist of the 18th century was far superior to the Geist of the 12th. He believed that the Jewish tradition must be renewed in order to survive the two pitfalls that were undermining it, pietistic fanaticism and scientific criticism. For him, the existence of the Jews was defying history in that their conception <coughs> of time escapes the metaphysical frameworks that the medieval tradition had presented. According to him, prophecies and miracles were replaced by the unfolding of rabbinical studies that altered the strictly monotheistic expression of faith. To get out of what he saw as an impasse, Krochmal had to elaborate a theory of the history of Judaism stretched between two poles, the quest for a spiritual absolute or evil total emergency <coughs> in the historical process. In this theory, time does not incarnate, incarnate or materialize in ritual or in history. It exists and must be fought for itself. Like medieval philosopher, Krochmal found the idea of a time that would be purely metaphysical in nature and aware of the immensity that separates people from the quest from the, for the absolute or God in time. So Krochmal transposed the proof in history, making it its instrument. Exegesis of the Hebrew Bible had led to the notion of a universal time in which Jewish temporality unfolds. Following them, biblical chronologies written by Jewish writers in late antiquity had introduced the idea that the staking of centuries obeys the direct movement. The count of time spent is between the articulation of a universal history and a specific history, aiming sometimes to insert the episodes of Jewish history in the mirror of the reigns of sovereigns whose existence is corroborated by historical sources, sometimes to fully situate their narrative in the temporality of their environment, as did Flavius Josephus, these chronologies develop a Jewish history unfolding in the double temporality of historical time. In contrast, the Seder Olam ignore any reconstruction that stands out from the biblical narrative. Its integration into the subsequent rabbinical corpus demonstrates the simultaneity of a twofold evolution which ends in the course of a second century. One tends to inscribe the Jewish chronology in parallel with that of a nation. The author ignores them. If the chronologies based on the Septuagint text make for some of them an allegorical use of the Bible with a universalist location, they attest to the existence of an exegetical historical activity of which only the most literal version had penetrated the tradition. The process of emergence of rabbinic Judaism would have led to the eviction of the heart of a tradition of a multiple insertion of Jews in history for the benefit of a sole biblical story. The time scale is now placed in the center of a Jewish history. However, 
the dual temporal weaker inner ones in Israel position among nations will continue outside the narratives, allowing Jews to simultaneously cling to a strictly Jewish temporality and to another one. Tradition had established that it was possible to experience time through its ritualization and the special relationship with God, including the Shabbat. Uh, this is a clock taken from the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam, indicating the time of the uh, end of the Shabbat, on a special Shabbat, any Shabbat. Uh, it is written, Motzei Shabbat, mm -hmm. which is clearly written. <coughs> the certain dosage made between profane time and sanctified time, allowing the Jewish temporality to go beyond the conception of a temporal opposed to the spiritual that Augustine had developed for Christianity. The eruption of philosophy, the penetration of the ideas of enlightenment followed by the entry into modernity accentuated the aporia inherent to this approach which combined the time of the history of the Jews with the time of immanence. Leaving aside the ritualization of time, modern thinkers such as Heinrich Goetz, Franz Rosenzweig, and uh, Walter Benjamin, detaching Jews from the time of history, reified mystical thought to place them in a time beyond. Conversely, Samson Raphael Hirsch or Abraham Joshua Heschel, more rooted in tradition, persisted in seeing the arrangement and rhythm of the calendar as the essential vector of Jewish time and temporality, the only and true Jewish way of life. As I said at the beginning of my talk, we are now in the 5,779 years since the creation of the universe. The process of setting the era since the creation as a way of dating can be followed in a continuous journey. The corpus of the Bible evokes the Persian or Arzacid dynasties, which can be found in the books of Haggai, Daniel, Zachariah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. The Mishnah recalled the Median and Greek kinship, and the Talmud mentioned the Seleucid era. The oldest archaeological and or epigraphic documentary sources attest to the use of a jubilee cycle covering 49 or 50 years, as well as the eras of the destruction of the temple, and fleetingly at the time of the Bar Korba's revolt in the 7th century, of the era of the Geulat Israel, the redemption of Israel. The era of creation of the world emerges in some Jewish texts from the fourth or five centuries and stabilizes itself before being turned into practice toward the 11th and 12th centuries only in the entire Jewish world. When contemplating the geographical and cultural landscape, one might see that the same process brought up the Muslim to make their outing with their Ejira and the Christian to deal with their rivals, Jews and Muslims, with the institution of the Anno Domini, thus putting an end to an unceasing debates about the computation of the Anno Mundi, not only with the Jews. Next point, the current state of the concept. In my opinion, the actual question of time studies is related to where the study stands and which target should the error be aimed at. Since we are now well aware of distant perspectives depending on whether you are a historian, a philosopher, a psychologist, or either a scientist in mathematics or astronomy, the conceptualization of time varies a lot. Yet, even if you content yourself with an historical frame, as I try to do, one has to take into account different registers. 
religious time differs from the social when it is considered as made up of scientific approaches largely encored of the current state of knowledge when things were fixed long time ago. Theological reflection in dialogue with others' religion, in the case of the Jews, Christian and Muslim, and philosophical consideration, which were all encompassed in the same and one set of knowledge until the modern era. In short, we are embedded in a threefold design of time's concept and perception. One is the infinite course of time, let's say the astronomical equivalent in religious approach to a place of God. The second is the historical, let's say that an event happened only once, and time is pursuing its course from the beginning to its end, the messianic era. The third is cyclical, the everlasting return of months, days, seasons, and festivals. As Stephen J. Gould summarizes, I'm quoting, in our tradition, these poles have recite or necessary attention because each captures an inevitable theme in the logic and psychology of how we understand history. The twin requirement of uniqueness to mark moment of time as distinctive and lawfulness to establish a basis for intelligibility. Studies on time in Judaism have been restrained for a long time to Christian biblical scholarship with a common which as a commonplace took only into consideration the scripture to better acknowledge the superiority of a Christian over the Jewish time with a blatant lack of attention of later Jewish conceptualization. Bible critics took it for granted that there was a profound difference between representation of time perceived by Indo-European and Semitic people. According to them, this difference revolved around the demarcation stated in terms of either a geometric or an anthropomorphic metaphor. In the geometric metaphor, the distinction is one between the circular and the liner. In the anthropomorphic metaphor, it is one between the eye and the ear. Various scholars claim that it was impossible for the Israelites to represent time otherwise than through the subjective perception of events as opposed to the Greeks' ability to distinguish between absolute time and space-time and presume that the Hebrews could not conceive abstract representations. Of course, this kind of assertion has fallen short and were drawn down by the Hellenistic scholars even though they found their way in many work asserting the specific and historical settings of the rabbis by the historical, be they historical or ever philosophical. The prevailing position can be presented as the following. The rabbis designated a non-era, a suspended place in time, preferring to refer to the recollection of past times rather than to place themselves in the present. Applying a mythical treatment to biblical reading, they made use of the heroes of the scripture for other purposes, turning them into emblematic figures for Torah study. The vision of linear time predominating in the Bible was then transformed and the rabbinical writing henceforth expressed a static vision of time. This is probably why Jacob Nusner, Nusner stated, I'm quoting, the rabbis thus traded history for eternity. End of quote. Mm -hmm. In addition, the seminal works of Chaim Yosef Yerushalmi, which emphasize the importance of rituals over history, added a layer to this interpretation while prompting a cohort of researchers to deal with memory generally in particular places and environment. To conclude, 
The register of time fulfills a dual function through intermingling different dimensions of experience at time to form the core of a Jewish modus vivendi. Transmission of tradition and the structuring of social life. These are prime aspects for the constitution of Jewish identity. When thinking about the endurance of the Jewish tradition and scrutinizing their evolution over times and places, one might understand that they were interwoven with the heritage as old as the antiques the, uh, the antique civilization coming from Mesopotamia and Egypt. Through the ages, this tradition has been accommodated to their environment, may it be Greek, Roman, Persian, Christian, or Muslim. As for now, to paraphrase both the Rossis, the 16th century thinker Azaria, and the 20th century historian of science, Paolo Rossi, while the Jews have a past of uh, 5,779 years only, they are perfectly aware as well of the fact that the thousands of years since the creation might be interpreted as being actually millions or billions of years since they know what is illustrated in a well-known Jewish joke, what is a day for God. Having set down as a world that Jewish life dwells within a double temporality, the Jewish era of time is not disturbed by the Jews' entrance into modernity and the topical world of technology and virtuality. One may recall that the Messiah is still expected to come, and some Jews do believe that he is actually already on his way in our time, whichever it might be. 